was uh, walking out of church on Thursday morning and if you remember on Thursday it was very very cold and there was a lot of black ice around and as I was sort of uh, walking uh, down the, the slope of the car park onto the pavement I just slipped slightly I had the wrong shoes on and uh, one of our neighbours who many of you will know who lives the other side of the, the road from here greeted me quite loudly and enthusiastically and I, I said oh hello it's, uh, it's a bit slippy isn't it and he replied, oh, you'll be all right. God's with you. <laughs> and uh, I think, I think he meant it as a joke. And uh, I took it as a joke because, of course, as we know, Christians are just as liable to slip on black ice as non-Christians. And yet at the same time, he spoke better than he knew. Because in Psalm 91, we read, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of of the Almighty. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. Now the psalmist is writing to Old Testament Israel and he's inviting them to worship and dwell with the covenant God, to faithfully walk with him and in so doing find shelter. Now the Israelites were always very keen on security and shelter but uh, they wanted it on their own terms often without God and so the psalmist is redirecting them and he's saying look you want safety and security you want true safety joy inner peace harmony contentment abide in God walk by faith trust him alone and through the storms you will find rest in his shadow refuge under his wings now David of course the David we encounter today in 1 Samuel, he was a man who knew more than most about life's storms. I think almost from the moment he stepped out to face Goliath, there were people opposing him. And yet he never walked alone. He walked with God. He rested in God. He trusted God. And therefore, he knew the favour of God. Now, I've entitled the sermon today, The Lord Was With Him. Because 1 Samuel 18 is a passage where we see just what a difference it makes when the Lord is with you because you're resting in him. Verse 12, Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with David. Verse 14, in everything he did he had great success because the Lord was with him. You see, Saul's heart was for himself. David's heart was for God. Now he wasn't perfect, we know that. But David was wholeheartedly for God, even to the point of making enemies. He, he wrote later on in Psalm 69, I endure scorn for your name and shame covers my face. I'm a stranger to my brothers, an alien to my mother's sons, for zeal for your house consumes me. Now that was the character and the heart of David, this great man of faith. And therefore, though he was opposed, because faith always is opposed, the Lord was with him. The most powerful man in the land, King Saul, hated him, but it was to no avail. Saul goes from sin to sin. David goes from strength to strength. Not because David was more gifted than Saul, but because the Lord was with him. And the Lord is always with those who seek his face and rest in him. Of course, we know that Psalm 91 was written in the Old Covenant, where there was physical prosperity for obedience. It doesn't quite translate into that for us today. We're not guaranteed health and wealth and prosperity or immunity from trouble. But there is a principle here that there is real comfort, strength and security and eternal security in the shadow of Almighty God through his son, Jesus, the Saviour. The one I've uh, spoken of in Hebrews 7. He's able to save completely to the uttermost those who come to God through him. Now, if you reject his authority, if you despise his love, if you ignore his commands, as Saul did, then don't be surprised at the resulting fallout. The lack of peace and joy within. The absence of clarity of thought and purpose. Checkered relationships. Destructive relationships. These things are li likely to follow. But for the believer who abides in Christ, who is united to Christ, 
they will experience his blessing in this life. Not necessarily in material goods, but in the heart, in relationship with him and with God's people. And most importantly, the believer knows that whatever storm may befall them in this life, they're safe from the eternal storm of God's judgment because they're safe in the Lord Jesus. And I think we see this in David, pre-cross, Old Testament David, he knew great peace and assurance as he rested in the shadow of the Almighty. And, and so what we're going to do this morning is consider the great contrast between David on the one hand as he rests and Saul as he does anything but rest, as he trusts in himself and is all het up and angry and hateful. And it's a very instructive contrast for us. But there's something else I think we need to keep in mind that really explains why David was so successful. Because, of course, he's not just a man in this passage. He stands as a type of Christ. He's a Messiah with a, a small m. He is beginning to deliver God's people. He's the Lord's anointed one. That's why he's given such extraordinary success. So we're not simply to put ourselves in David's shoes and say, I'm going to be David. We need to put ourselves into the shoes of the people around David, because, of course, there were differing responses to God's Messiah in this chapter. And there are differing responses, aren't there, to the Messiah? And so the question comes and we'll come back to this question at the end. How are we going to respond to the Messiah, to the Lord Jesus? How are we responding and how will we? Now, we'll start um, just at the end of chapter 17 with a little bit of background. Remember, David has defeated Goliath. He's instigated this stunning victory over the Philistines. David was the only man in the whole of Israel who cared enough about the honour of God and trusted enough in the power of God to step out and defeat that nine foot six giant and fight for God's people and God's honour. And suddenly, David is a celebrity. Everyone wants a piece of him. Saul himself wants to know who David is, we're told, at the end of chapter 17. Which is, uh, I suppose, a little bit confusing, given he already knew David. David was his court musician and his armour bearer. But uh, it's a different kind of knowing. You see, Saul had a manifesto pledge to keep. Earlier on, the king seeking to try and motivate some Israelite to fight against Goliath, had promised his daughter in marriage and to exempt the man's family from tax. And so now Saul has to follow through. So he needs to find out a little bit about David's family background. Where has he come from? Where did he live? And so on. Now, initially, Saul had no problem doing this because, after all, he'd benefited from David's victory. Any victory over the Philistines, however it came, could only benefit Saul's kingship. So it was politically convenient for Saul to keep David close and bring him into his household permanently and bask, as it were, in the reflected glow of David's glory. And besides, we were told in chapter 16 that Saul liked David. David was a very likeable, winsome kind of man. But I think it's certainly true to say that Saul's main response to David at this point was driven by convenience more than anything else. David is a pawn on his political chessboard. He's useful to him. But that's about to change. You see, David hasn't just won a battle, has he? David has won the hearts of the people. It's not that Israel has rejected Saul because they haven't. They have simply fallen for this new hero. And this soon becomes apparent following the victory over Goliath and the subsequent victory over the rest of the Philistines. Saul and his troops, with David in tow, return to headquarters in Gibeah. And on the way, they pass through many of the smaller towns and villages of Israel. It's a victorious procession. And already the startling news of what has taken place has reached the ears of the ordinary people of this new hero the giant slayer and it captures the imagination and the women with their tambourines and their lutes dance and sing Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands now 
I think it's very unlikely that the women were trying to be derogatory to the king of Israel or, or even trying to make a political point. This was simply an outpouring of innocent enthusiasm for the saviour of Israel using the kind of inflated language you might get on the football terraces today. You know, you've heard this one, Aston Villa FC are by far the best team the world has ever seen. Now, I think we know that they're not. And those singing about them know that they're not. But that's not the point, is it? It's the language of celebration. And in this case, of course, it was quite right. David had, after all, defeated Goliath. And uh, any reasonable person, however much of a loyalist to Saul they were, would have surely seen it's David's day. But at the same time, this song felt pointed because within that song was a direct comparison. Saul, second. Yes, he's slain thousands. He's pretty good. David is first. He's slain tens of thousands. And Saul, sad to say, is not a mature enough man to deal with this. Although, in fact, there was good reason for this to sting him. Saul hadn't forgotten those devastating words from the prophet Samuel many years before. The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you and has given it to one of your neighbours, to one better than you. I imagine those words had been burned into Saul's consciousness. And suddenly, as the women sing, he hears their words mingled with Samuel's and they echo around his head. One of your neighbours, one better than you, Saul has slain his thousands, David his tens of thousands. And it goes on in his mind and suddenly the thought arrives unbidden. What if David's that man better than me? What if David has arisen to take the kingship from me? Now thoughts are pretty powerful things, aren't they? And, and sometimes they can flash into our heads as if from nowhere. And sometimes they can even be put there by the devil himself. But the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians that every argument and pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and every thought, even those random stray thoughts, they're to be taken captive to make them obedient to Christ. In other words, don't let your thoughts just get away from you. Don't give them a foothold. When you feel some kind of unrighteous anger and bitterness or selfishness flaring up and you're aware, well, I could start to think about these things, don't. Subdue those thoughts, surrender them to the Lord, give them to him, turn your mind to him. What's it say? Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face and I can't remember the rest of it, but the things of this world grow strangely dim. And that's true when we're thinking. What are we thinking about? Now, Saul, of course, he doesn't act on that at all. He does the opposite. He indulges the thought and it's allowed to fester and to take root. Verse 8 says he was very angry and the refrain galled him. It rankled within him. They've credited David with tens of thousands and me only with thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? And from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. You know, I think it's one of the most painful lessons that any child ever learns. And as we grow up and we, we, we mature, we continually learn this lesson. That there's always someone who possesses something you don't. Or possesses something you have, but in greater measure. Whether it's things or gifts, whatever. Personality, looks, fame, fortune and the rest. There's always someone who's got more than you. Now, if that's a painful lesson, how much more painful when the person who has what you lack or has more than you is one close to you, as it were, a direct competitor? I mean, it's fine, isn't it, to be OK with someone who's far removed from you having more. I don't think any of us are jealous of the Queen for having more money than us. But what about when it's your friend, your relative, your neighbour, someone you grew up with? And you feel you've worked as hard as they have, and they're doing better than you. <clears throat> Oscar Wilde once told uh, a story of the devil crossing the Libyan desert. And uh, along the way, he came upon a spot 
where a number of his minions were tormenting a holy hermit, tempting him to sin. And yet this saintly man resisted their temptations. And so the devil decided to teach his minions a lesson. What you do is too crude, he said to them. You watch this. And he went forward and he whispered in the hermit's ear. And instantly that hermit's serene expression changed and a furious frown clouded his face. And the devil's minions were astonished. What did you say to him? The devil replied, I told him that his brother has just been made Bishop of Alexandria. You see, jealousy is a destructive thing. Along with its cousin envy, it's probably one of the most destructive of all sins. James 3, 16, where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. Proverbs 14, 30, a heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. Jealousy is discontentment, it's covetousness, it's pride all rolled into one, and it will tear you up inside. You might have any number of good gifts from God, loads of wonderful opportunities, the sun might be shining in your life, but in, in your mind, in your heart, it's dark and gloomy. All because that person close to you, who unfairly possesses in your mind what you feel should be yours. And if you can't have it, why should they? And yet he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High rests in the shadow of the Almighty. And that rest includes resting in God's sovereign ordering of your circumstances. Yes, the Lord may have given another person more than you. But that's not your concern, is it? That's God's concern. He's Lord of your life. And in fact, he's sovereign Lord of all, even those who rebel against him. So for your part, the believer's part is to trust that God is working all things out for the good of those who trust him, both now and eternally. And far from being jealous of others, the believer is actually pleased for their success and prays that God may bless them, which is a challenge, isn't it? Can we say that we pray for those who we resent, perhaps those who we feel we're competing with? Do we want the best for those close to us, even if it means they supplant us and overshadow us and do better than us, knowing that actually the glory belongs to the Lord? Saul isn't concerned for the glory of God. He's concerned with his own glory. He's an insecure man because, of course, his security is not in God. And therefore, he cannot bear to be supplanted or overshadowed, certainly not by a neighbour, certainly not by some young man from Bethlehem, and certainly not because Saul knows full well that the Lord has departed from him. Saul will never have the success that David is enjoying because the Spirit of the Lord has left him. So he doesn't rest in the Lord. The Lord isn't his focus. And left to himself, Saul wallows in himself, in his jealousy, in his insecurity. And as James says, where those kinds of things abide, there you will find, as sure as night follows day, disorder and every evil practice, as we're going to see. The very next day, David is back in his old role. Court musician, player of the harp, soothing melodies for Saul. The giant slayer is content to resume humble service. It's the kind of man David was, not proud. But Saul, he's brooding even more than usual. He's staring into space as he plays with a spear in his hand. He doesn't hear the music, he just sees David. And he hears those words bouncing in his head. Saul has slain his thousands, David is tens of thousands a big repetitive loop and suddenly with no warning Saul hurls his spear at David hoping in a, in a murderous rage to pin him to the wall now David thankfully was a young and fit man whose reactions were excellent he manages to avoid the incoming spear and Saul for the moment is left disappointed although the truth is 
This was an act of God's grace, and not just for David, but for Saul himself. Can you imagine if all Israel had heard the news that their new young hero, the slayer of the giant, had been murdered by jealous King Saul? I think it's likely that uh, Saul might have been toppled that day. So as it is, thanks to the grace and the provision and the protection of God, both Saul and David live to fight another day. And this time, Saul tries a different tactic. Having David around is just too much for him. So he gives David command of a thousand men, a leading role in Israel's military campaigns, and he sends them off. Out of sight, out of mind. The problem was that reports keep coming back to him of David's great success because the Lord is with him and he flourishes under the blessing of the Lord and Saul is even more jealous. He can't see that the Lord really is with David. He, he knows it, but he doesn't see the implications, the futility of trying to resist. So he stubbornly continues his crusade against this man who was actually Israel's greatest asset. Saul tries another tactic. He offers his oldest daughter in marriage on condition of faithful service in battle in the forlorn hope that David will strive so hard to, to win the prize that he will fall in battle. But there's only one problem. David is too humble a man to grasp at the prize. Now, in actual fact, uh, careful readers will note that just a few days earlier, on the battlefield, Saul had offered his oldest daughter to the one who defeated Goliath, and David had done so. So this was a prize that he was, was his right. He didn't need to earn it, it was his. But David is so self-effacing. He, he's just David, son of Jesse, of Bethlehem. Who, who's he to be marrying a princess? So Saul has to find a different way. He casually offers his daughter to another man. No thought given to her feelings. And then later, another opportunity presents itself. Saul discovers that another of his daughters, Michael, is in love with David. It's another opportunity to snare David. A better opportunity, given Michael has genuine feelings for David. Again, humble David is reluctant. I'm only a poor man. I'm little known. He doesn't have the sufficient means to pay the bride price for Saul's daughter. He's still young. He's still finding his way. He's not there trying to make a name for himself. He's not trying to get up the greasy pole. This is not false humility. This is who David really was. Small in his own eyes. But Saul insists, look, don't worry about the money, David. The only price you need to pay is a hundred Philistine foreskins. Now, that's a rather unusual price to pay, isn't it? The Israelites viewed the Philistines with disgust because, of course, they were uncircumcised. And circumcision was the outward sign or mark of God's covenant with Israel. So the Philistines, as God's enemies, were uncircumcised. They were heathen. Hence this unusual but symbolic price tag, a hundred Philistine foreskins. And more importantly, Saul calculates this time, David is surely going to lose. He's going to lose his life. This is too much, even for David. But again, Saul has underestimated just what it means when the Lord is with you. David succeeds. In fact, he doubles the amount required. It's uh, 200 Philistines he takes out, not 100. And he returns victorious. He wins the prize of Saul's daughter. And now he's officially a member of Saul's family. He's royalty. So that worked well, didn't it? And Saul is stumped. In fact, he's more than stumped. Three times in this chapter, verse 12, verse 15, and verse 29, we're told that he is afraid of David. Now imagine that. Saul's the man with the spear. David's the unarmed man with the harp. Saul is the king with all the power and resources of kingship. David's the shepherd boy from Bethlehem. And yet Saul is the man who's afraid. 
Why? Well, it's now at last, and Saul is dense spiritually, but it's starting to dawn upon him that the spirit who had left him is very clearly with David. And it's only a matter of time before the kingdom will be taken from him. It's all beginning to crumble, just as it had been foretold. And Saul is given over to fear, faithless, selfish, tormenting fear of David, of Samuel the prophet, fear of the Lord, a terror of the Lord, fear of everyone, fear expressed in hate. Like many of the most brutal dictators and tyrants the world has seen, deep down Saul is afraid. He's got no peace and it's only going to get worse for him. If only he'd humbled himself, if only he'd repented of, of his pride and his hate, he could have humbly served the Lord. He could have offered up protection for, for David, resources for him. Not Saul. He's a lost man, a lost cause. Not because the Lord had just given him up, but because Saul had given the Lord up first. He stands in scripture alongside people like the Pharaoh in Exodus, a man with a hardened heart. He's the warning against the person who hardens their heart against what they know. He's a tragic, tragic figure. And yet what of David? You would think, of course, that David would be afraid. Not Saul. I mean, it was David's life that was in danger here. And yet we're told again and again, Saul's afraid and we're not told anything about David. So what of David? Well, what's really interesting is that all through this chapter, from a, a narrator's point of view, Saul is our point of view character. So we know what Saul is thinking and feeling because we're presented things from his perspective. We're told what he's thinking and feeling. And as for David, well, his character's very much on the exterior. We don't really know what he's thinking or feeling. And that is a deliberate choice of the narrator because you see, the Lord is with David. We're told it again and again and again. David prospers because the Lord is with him. And that's really all that matters for the narrator. And it's all that matters for David. He knows it doesn't matter how he feels or thinks. He's with the Lord. The Lord's with him. The sovereign God's central. And that's why, fresh from the elation of victory over Goliath, David is content to go back to being a court musician because David knew that the victory was the Lord's and the Lord was with him. And that's why, with every success on the battlefield, David is grounded. He knows it's the Lord's doing. And that's why David refuses the offer of Saul's daughter in marriage because he's just David, small in his own eyes. The Lord is the one enthroned in David's heart. He's resting in the Lord. Therefore, we hear nothing of David's anxieties or fears, presumably because there's peace there. There's no room for the storms of passion and the murmurings of self-will and crippling fears and doubts. David knew what the hymn writer wrote about. Stayed upon Jehovah, hearts are fully blessed, finding, as he promised, perfect peace and rest. That's the big difference between David and Saul. It's not one of human gifting or ability. It's a matter of the heart, as it always is in 1 Samuel. God looks on the heart. And he saw where David's heart lay. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. David was doing that. Saul wasn't. Now, if you're not resting in the Lord today, if you're not trusting him for the forgiveness of your sins, if you're not depending upon him, seeking to walk in step with his Holy Spirit, well then what are you doing? You might be doing a lot of things, a lot of thinking. There'll be a lot going on up here, but really it amounts to this, you're trusting in yourself. And that is not a firm place to build your life upon. And don't be surprised if like Saul, you keenly feel the lack of inner peace and joy and all those thoughts whirring around in your mind and the absence of clarity and thought and it begins to pour out and bubble over into your relationships with other people. And there's a better way, isn't there? 
a saving way, trusting in the Lord Jesus and in him alone. Because as you rest in Christ and depend upon him, you will see a difference. I'm not saying your problems are going to vanish away, they won't. But they will be given a different and a right perspective. They are set against the security and refuge of knowing the creator, the one who holds the future in his hands and holds all things in his hands. And therefore you won't be paralyzed by fear or terror. Fear won't dominate and control you within because you know the one who loves you and gave his life for you and promised surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now, before we finish, we're just going to travel back. We'll leave Saul where he is and we'll travel back to the beginning of chapter 18. Because we've seen the contrast between Saul and David. There's also a contrast between Saul and his son, Jonathan. Because remember, as I said at the beginning, David isn't just one of us. In a sense, he stands apart, which is another reason, I think, for the way the narrator keeps him on the exterior because he is the Lord's anointed, a foreshadowing of the Messiah to come, a figure of huge importance, which is why it's such a serious thing that Saul is trying to oppose him. But the question is, what are other people going to do? What will Jonathan do? Remember that Jonathan was the crown prince, second in command, heir to the throne. Not long before, Jonathan had been the hero. And now suddenly there's a new hero in town. This town ain't big enough for the both of us, is what you would think Jonathan would think. That he would resent David. And yet, it's quite the reverse. The very first verse of chapter 18 says that after David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. Now it's an extraordinary way, a unique way, to talk about friendship and it's all the more extraordinary when you think of how much Jonathan had to lose by allying with David and what's more Jonathan and David they weren't natural friends they weren't close in age or background or experience but you see Jonathan instinctively saw in David a kindred spirit do you remember when we first meet Jonathan in chapter 14 and he's a man who's not content to sit by passively? He wants to take the fight to Israel's enemies. He's a man of faith. He says nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. And for a long time, Jonathan had been on his own, the only man willing to step out in faith. And now Jonathan has just witnessed this young man, far younger than him, do what no one else had been willing to do. This rarity in Israel, a man who shared Jonathan's own passion for the honour of God, a man of like heart and mind, only a man greater even than he. Because even Jonathan hadn't dared to fight Goliath. David had. And Jonathan isn't jealous. He's thrilled and he's filled with a deep love and admiration. For this young man this isn't erotic romantic love so please 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 do not trivialize this and reduce it into some gay love story because it's not that this is true friendship this is costly sacrificial covenantal commitment it says in verse 3 that jonathan made a com covenant with david he took off the robe he was wearing he gave it to david along with his tunic even his sword and Jonathan and Saul had the best swords in the land, iron swords. Jonathan gives it to David. He's pledging his loyalty to David in the bonds of friendship. And it's almost as if Jonathan in that moment is abdicating his own rights to the throne of Israel. See, Jonathan didn't know, of course, in that moment that, that uh, David actually was the anointed one. But he clearly discerned that the Lord was with David and wasn't with his father Saul. And he didn't panic. He didn't think, well, I need to try and bolster my position now. He says to David, I'm yours. I'm with you. Even if it means surrendering my own rights, my own conveniences and my own position, you have my sword. 
And I wonder, I wonder if that's how we respond to the Lord Jesus, the one who was successful. The Lord, the Lord was with Jesus all the way through his earthly ministry, even to the cross. And he did what was needed to be done. And he, he was victorious. And you see, when it comes to God's Messiah, the, the remarkable thing is that the initiative is the other way round. Jonathan comes to, to David, but the Messiah came to us. We were there, sinners, not interested at all. And what did Jesus do? He, he didn't just take off his robe, did he? He emptied himself. He entered our world, shorn of his heavenly glory, became a servant, obedient even to Calvary's cross. And he paid for our sin. He died in our stead. He rose from death, defeating its power. And at the right hand of God, he stands today, arms wide out, offering us relationship with the living God. He says, I'm God's Messiah. I'm the anointed king. Seek refuge and shelter in me. And the question is, will we? Will we be like Jonathan? ready to give up and surrender the things closest to us for the sake of the Lord. Will we say to the Messiah today, I'm yours. I'm willing to surrender my rights and my conveniences for, for this one who surrendered so much more in my stead. You know, once I wanted to be king of my life, but now I gladly surrender my sinful sovereignty for the light and easy yoke of the King of Heaven. That's what's required. I think that's what Jonathan is teaching us here. That's to be our response to the Lord's anointed one. Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were an offering far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. So what will you do with God's Messiah? Time is short, isn't it? David was opposed by Saul. Saul, if you like, is an antichrist figure in the Old Testament, opposing the purposes of God. And Jesus is opposed. He always has been. There have been antichrists in every age. There is a final antichrist who is soon to be revealed to this world. And he's going to make war like never before on Christ and Christ's people. And we need to be sure of whose side we're on. Like Jonathan, we need to align ourselves with the King of Kings. God is with Jesus. His victory is sure. There's nothing we can do to stop it. What we can do is to surrender to him and trust him and be safe from the eternal storm that's coming. I pray this morning that we will do so, that we will draw near to the Lord Jesus, surrender to him and bask in the shelter of his wings and, and the peace that he offers us. May we do so. Amen. Amen. Now we're going to meet around the Lord's table in a minute but before we do we're going to sing number 350 um, and uh, this wasn't written by David. It was written but by a man who <coughs> suffered much and a man who lost I think it was all his children in a terrible storm at sea. And yet he was dwelling in the shelter of the Almighty and he was able to say it's well with my soul. He had peace like a river. And uh, if we're trusting in Jesus, no matter what's happening outside, no matter what may be said about us, we can have peace like a river too. So uh, may we stand and sing this together, 350.